Welcome back environmentalists for part two of lecture 16 on endangered species. So you just took a break. Hopefully it was sponsored by something really awesome. I don't know, maybe like Sonic, if you saw my Sonic shirt in the last uh, lecture that I gave. But coming back to us now, let's, uh, let's sponsor our endangered species with uh, some good data and understanding about the ESA and the red list. So we just learned about all these different listing categories. Now we're going to apply the rest of the sections that I wanted you to learn about, which is 9, 10, and 11, and talk about how that applies to the Endangered Species Act. So remember we started with section four and that had a bunch of stuff in it like critical listing, habitat, uh, then it had of course the listing categories. Now we're moving into enforcement and prohibitions. So I like to think of section nine is this is what you can't do. Section 10 is here's what you can do if you have an exception even though you're breaking nine. And if you know what 9 is and you don't have an exception in 10, then guess what? You're going to have some bad news in Section 11, and that's where the penalties are. So 9 is the bad news, 10 are the exceptions to the rule, and 11 is what's going to happen to you if you don't have the exception. So let's start with Section 9. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA fisheries are designated as the federal enforcement agencies for the Endangered Species Act. So by law, under the ESA, they are the two enforcing agencies that can levy fines and put penalties on people, including crimes. So Section 9 of the Endangered Species Act prohibits the illegal possession, importation, exportation, and, or domestic slash foreign sale of listed species. So that's quite a bit of stuff to take in there. So you have to think about it. You can't bring them in. You can't take them out. You can't sell them, whether it's here or in another country, if they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. Section 9 also prohibits removing a listed species from the wild, and it defines a super important term called taking. So we're going to look at that more closely because if you take the habitat of an endangered species or a listed species, then you are in violation of Section 9 of the ESA. So let's look at the taking clause that's outlined in Section 9, guaranteed test question. So if a spe species is listed as either endangered or threatened, on your property, you must avoid quote unquote taking that species. So what exactly is taking? If you look in the right picture here, you'll see a golden cheek warbler, which is an endangered bird in the state of Texas. It's common nesting sites are found in juniper trees. So that's basically like cedar trees. So bottom line is if you were to cut that tree down in your property, and it was the known nesting site of a golden cheek warbler, you would be guilty of taking. So here's the actual definition of taking. It's defined by the Endangered Species Act as, quote unquote, dot, 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 to harm, harass, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt in, to engage in any such activity. So I'm not so sure so many of you would harass an animal. I'm sure none of you would intentionally do that. Although I did as I was like a three-year-old in Houston, and I didn't know this toad was the Houston toad. But I played with this toad, and I played with it every day. It was like my pet, my friend. And now it's listed. So, uh, you know, hey, sometimes these things happen. But good news for me, it just really hadn't been officially listed on the ESA yet. But even back then, none of us would have had knowledge that it was on the list. So I guess that's an example of harassing. Harming would be to actually want to hurt it. Pursuing it would be maybe tracking or following. Hunting is obvious. Shooting, wounding, killing, trapping, and capturing are all very straightforward definitions. And also look at that or attempt to engage in any such conduct. So you have to be careful that you're not building a site or altering a location that could be a known location where taking could occur and taking of the golden cheek warblers nesting sites would be a case in point. So the habitat clause is also listed in section nine of the Endangered Species Act. 
So remember section nine is all about the prohibition. So basically it says that any type of development, including construction and grading, that could result in the quote unquote taking of a protected species is prohibited by law. And that's federal law for the Endangered Species Act. So any person who violates this portion of the Endangered Species Act is subject to criminal penalties and possible imprisonment. Now there are civil penalties associated with the Endangered Species Act, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but intentional violations where people seek to avoid the law, circumvent the law, that's criminal action. All right, so let's say you know what the bad news is, you know what taking is, you know what that habitat or a critical habitat clause is, and you realize that a project you're fixing to do, let's say you're going to build a house or you're in a city or a government, and you're going to need to build a road or change a road or build a highway, something along those lines. Section 10 enumerates various exemptions from the taking clause. In other words, it gives you an option. It gives you an exemption. So if a construction project, for example, occurs within a habitat of a listed species, Section 10 permits an exemption with limitations on spe specific permissible impacts to that species habitat. In other words, it'll say you can do X, Y, Z, but not A, B, C. So it's very clear on what you can and cannot do to the taking of that species. If harm cannot be avoided, the project agency can seek an exemption from the Endangered Species Committee. This committee consists of key officials and one state representative. In order for this to pass and to be granted an exemption, five of the seven members must approve that the taking is legitima uh, legitimate before the exemption can be granted. So there's a case study involving the exemption, which is Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act. And it's a very important case where the Portland Audubon Society versus the Endangered Species Committee of 1992 was heard in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. This is over uh, a really important bird, and it's the Northern Spotted Owl, probably one of the most recognizable uh, faces of endangered species in the Audubon Society world. So the outcome of the case was found that three committee members had been Ill, in illegal ex parte contact with President George H.W. Bush. What exactly does that mean? Well, there's a whole report on that if you want to get to the bottom of it. But essentially, some inappropriate uh, contact that could have swayed their opinions on this particular topic. So the exemption that was being granted for taking was actually for the Bureau of Land Management. They manage uh, timber resources as well, as well as the land and so forth on those properties. And so the timber sale uh, produced incidental takes of the habitat for the Northern Spotted Owl. So if this happened in Oregon, basically the Portland Audubon Society said, hey, we disagree with this, you are allowing an, an incidental taking for this listed species by the Bureau of Land Management. And it's not legit because the committee passed an exemption and honored it when they shouldn't have. So this story kind of comes along with tree huggers. You might have actually heard that term, but there were people who actually chained themselves to trees to prevent these uh, from being cut down. That's kind of why it's a famous case. So the northern spotted owl was listed as a threatened species throughout its range in northern California, Oregon, and Washington state because of loss to the old growth forests that exist in those regions. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service previously had reviewed the status of the owl in 1982, 1987, and 1989, but found it, that it neither met the established criteria, remember that's criteria one, two, three, four, or five, things like loss of habitat, destruction of habitat, uh, overutilization, those things. So uh, a court order ceased logging in the national forest containing known habitats of the northern spotted owl because of this lawsuit that got filed. Now let's move into section 11. So just to review, section 9 was here is what you can't do. Section 10 was an exemption to what you can't do. Section 11 is mm, here's the bad news if you broke section 9 and you didn't have an exemption in 10. So it's the penalties and enforcement. 
Essentially, some specialized Endangered Species Act violations can result in a fine up to $50,000 and or imprisonment for one year, and that's per violation per day as an FYI. So when you're talking about violations, the rules are usually pretty clear that it's by instance and by day. Other less serious violations may result in a fine up to $25,000. Regardless, that is pretty substantial penalties for one day of some kind of breaking of the law for Section 9. So this is the bad news in Section 10. We've broken the law in 9. So in, in this case, you got a grizzly bear over here who's been poached, and this was an intentional violation of the Endangered Species Act. Likely, this would be something of an imprisonment somewhere, or I mean, or a fine of anywhere from $25,000 to $50,000 with possible imprisonment. So not something that anyone wants to have to deal with. I find it important to share a real-life case study of this because sometimes it's hard to visualize that people are capable of breaking laws like this, but they are. So let's look at a fishing vessel, the Camelar. This particular vessel had permits to fish in the Gulf of Alaska for sable fish and halibut, but only for a very specified amount. So they had a quota, in other words, that they couldn't exceed. So this guy fished in a regulatory area and submitted falsified reports. Now keep in mind those are federal reports, so now you've lied on a federal document, right? So he undervalued his catch. In other words, he reported lower numbers than he, than he actually caught. So the value of the fish was $100,000. Because of the serious offense, he was sentenced as follows in 2011. He got 10 months in prison, so not the full year, a $50,000 fine, so he got maxed out on the fine, and $100,000 in community service payment to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to enhance fisheries habitat in Alaska. So not, not only did he get hit with the max fine and he got hit with almost the max imprisonment, he got hit with a humongous amount of community service in restitution. So this is the kind of thing that happens out in the real world with examples of criminal activity regarding the Endangered Species Act. So we're going to look at some listed species today and we're going to examine what they are and how they're listed. The first few will be internationally listed for the red list and then we'll move into domestically listed for the Endangered Species Act. So the first question you might be thinking is, do I need to know the listing status? My answer is yes, you do. So make sure you know the listing status. Remember the abbreviations are necessary. So the IUCN is that red list that's designated for organisms that are worldwide uh, either threatened or vulnerable or endangered. So in this case, we'll look at the African elephant. The IUCN listed as vulnerable or VN on the red list. So this happened uh, end result of ivory being uh, taken from elephants and usually they would be poached and that ended up with mothers uh, being killed and their babies being left uh, to die out without any mother. The African elephant is protected by the red list by the IUCN as vulnerable, and that's its listing status. An international ivory trade ban was established and passed in 1990 because poachers killed more than one half of African elephant population in a specified period of time. We went from 1.3 million populations of African elephants down to 600,000. One area of Africa in particular was most heavily hit by uh, poaching of the African elephant, and that was Kenya. Their populations dwindled by 85% between the years of 1973 and 1989, which led to, of course, the 1990 ban on international trade of ivory. So the key issue with, between elephants and a growing human population is that the elephants are um, are trying to get away from the humans. And so they're trying, there's kind of a struggle there between water resources, land availability, and the elephants must have the water in order to survive. So it can be kind of a difficult situation to balance the needs between the humans and the animals, the constant story of the Endangered Species Act. 
So let's look at the panda bear. This is the IUCN red list of EN for endangered. The panda's primary threat is habitat loss and low birth rates, both in captivity in the wild, so both in zoos and out in nature. Interesting thing that the panda relies solely on one food resource for survival, and that's the bamboo forest of China for its food and habitat. So China is the number one populated country in the world, something to consider. So they've grown out of their metropolitan areas and are starting to grow into rural areas up mountains where these bamboo forests are located. After 1949, the population boom in China created stress on the panda's habitat, and the subsequent famines led to the increased hunting of wildlife, including pandas. So you can see how human population, they turned to food resources, and the panda bear became a target. One of the reasons the panda bear is considered such a rare species is it's not really as closely related to bears as it is raccoons. And it's only found in one place in the world. So this is a very rare exotic species and it's very much in threat of it being endangered and it is listed that way on the red list. Let's look at the IUCN's black rhinoceros listing for the red list of CR. Remember that stands for critically endangered. So just if you didn't know, rhinoceroses are listed based on the morphology of their lips. I know that's kind of a weird thing, but basically the morphology of their lips dictates what they eat. While we like to judge them by their color and they're named by color, don't be deceived. It's really about their lips and, and also their horns. For the most part of the 20th century, the continental black rhinoceros was the most numerous of all living rhinoceros species. There was around 200,000 living in Africa alone. Well, that would all change. Less than 2,500 black rhinos remain in the wild today. Humans have killed rhinoceroses for their horns. While they're not ivory, they are bought and sold on the black market. You might think, why? If they're not ivory, what's the deal? They're kind of like, a, well, they are made out of keratin, but they're kind of a fibrous material if you've ever felt them, and they're almost like a bumper for a car. They help with uh, butting heads and allowing them to kind of be a shock absorber. Some cultures actually utilize these horns for ornamental and traditional uh, medis medicine reasons. So they have some value in some cultures, a significant value actually. Since they're made of keratin, they grow like fingernails and hair. So that's kind of cool fact to know if you didn't already. So let's move into a special story of the mountain gorilla. The IUCN currently has them on the red list listed as EN, which is endangered. Habitat loss represents their number one greatest threat to the mountain gorilla populations. The forests where the mountain gorillas live are surrounded by rapidly increasing growing human settlements, another human population growth issue. Slash and burn practices agricultural pasture expansion and logging practices in villages and forest zones have caused fragmentation of this particular listed species habitat. So these gorillas are really, really famous and for a reason that we'll be covering now. Let's look at a case study, a very special one that's a pioneer and a champion for the cause of endangered species. Diane Fossey is considered to be an international icon for species conservation. Basically, she's a martyr. A large publicity of her cause because she sought out to protect the mountain gorilla from extinction. If you'd really like to learn a lot about this lady, she's very intriguing. And uh, how she got over to Africa to study these is a story in itself. But in 1977, Fossey's uh, favorite gorilla named Digit was killed and murdered, actually decapitated. Here's how it happened. Digit defended his group of um, gorillas against six poachers and their poaching dogs. They ran across the gorilla study group, and in doing so, uh, they were confronted with Digit. The poachers uh, speared Digit five times, removed his hands, and decapitated his head. This was an important detail because it was a message to send to Diane Fossey. Everybody knew in that area how much Diane detested poachers. She was extremely ver uh, verbal and had really 
in a nice way ticked off a whole bunch of uh, people who ran the poaching industry in that area. And this is actually Diane Fossey that you're seeing in the picture right here. She became so effective at the study group that the clan actually absorbed her as one of them. So basically she was able to help raise the babies like Digit. After Digit's body was discovered, Fossey's group captured one of the killers and he fessed up who the rest of them were. And they were later uh, sent to prison, or three of them were. Fossey created the Digit Fund, which is a nonprofit organization to raise money for anti poaching patrols. Unfortunately, Fossey was uh, murdered in 1985 in her hut. And it's a tragic story. Again, you would need to either watch Gorillas in the Mist and read the book and or do some research on this case to find out exactly what happened. But her case still remains unsolved. But she is still buried today next to Digit, which is kind of a, a special story. So this person is kind of the beginning of the icon of championing the cause of rescuing and doing conservation efforts to protect endangered species. Let's look at the IUCN's humpback whale. Now, while we have the humpback whale in the United States, it's a worldwide species. It's LC, so least concern, but it didn't used to be. It was on the brink of extinction for a long time. So let's look at this recovery action for the species. During the 20th century, at least 200,000 humpbacks were killed, reducing the global population by over 90%. So we only have like 10% left. So there's a high probability of a, an extinction that could occur. So in 1946, the International Whaling Commission, known as the IWC, founded, uh, was founded to oversee the whaling industry. And then they imposed and passed rules and regulations for hunting whales in international waters. So they did this to establish a, real hunting seasons and quotas that were allowable. So commercial humpback whaling was banned in 1966 because this didn't quite work. The initial International Whaling Commission quotas did not stand and didn't improve the numbers that well. By that time, the uh, population had been reduced to a sheer 5,000, so we're in serious trouble now. The ban is still in force today, and the populations have increased to 80,000 worldwide. It's a success story, so that's why we're back to calling it least concern under the red list. Another species under the IUCN is the Bengal tiger, and it's listed on the red list as EN for endangered. Interesting, a couple of facts about tigers that's not in your lecture, but I think you might want to know it. Each tiger stripe is kind of like a fingerprint, so if you uh, take off their fur, they still have the stripes. kind of neat. So they can be identified by their markings. Tiger populations have been substantially reduced from poaching for their fur and destruction of their habitat, so they are a highly sought-after poached item. 100,000 tigers were estimated to exist in around 1900 in the wild. That number, however, has dwindled. The population is now between 1500 and 3500 in the wild. So kind of a sad loss for these particular animals, and a series of tigers have gone extinct already, just not the Bengal tiger that uh, there were seven different species a hundred years ago and now we only have five species and the Bengal is one of those that's endangered. So we're moving into the Endangered Species Act. So we shifted gears from the red list to the Endangered Species Act. This is the Hawaiian monk seal. I took this shot in Hawaii, actually in, on the island of Kauai to be exact. And the ESA has listed the Hawaiian monk seal as endangered EN. Seal populations have declined rapidly in recent years because of human activity within the most isolated areas of the Hawaiian island chain. During the 19th century, these poor little guys were clubbed to death by poachers for their meat, fat oils, and skin. Now don't get me wrong, while they're cute and all, they're not the nicest little critters on around, but they're very just skilled swimmers and hunters. Not so, um, should I say... They're very awkward on land, so if you've ever seen one on land, they just kind of look like this. So I was not near this animal, just so you know. I had a very good zoom lens to get this close. What are some of the reasons, um, human reasons, that are byproducts of why this particular species become endangered? Entanglement in fishing nets have also led to a decline of the seal population. 
In the northwestern Hawaiian islands, starvation has become a critical problem for the Hawaiian monk seal because of their lack of their primary food resource, which is lobsters. So this is one of those animals that helps keep check and balance uh, in terms of certain kinds of foods and fisheries, and it's on the brink of having problems of extinction because of its food resources being depleted, and that's from fishing primarily. Let's look at the snail darter. You can't talk about endangered species and not talk about this one. Uh, this is threatened according to the Endangered Species Act. This is was listed in 1975 and was initially native to only the Little Tennessee River. Its presence forced a two-year halt in the construction in the Teleco Dam because its team generating the Environmental Impact Statement, known as an EIS, missed the species during survey. What a bummer. That was kind of an important thing not to miss, right? The snail darter was introduced to the near by Hiawassee River in 1984, and the Teleco Dam was eventually completed, although no hydroelectric power was ever able to be generated at this dam. And this is your little snail darter over here. Let's look at the Florida manatee that's listed as endangered or EN under the Endangered Species Act. The, prim the main or primary cause of death uh, for this particular marine mammal, the manatee, is boat collisions. You can look at this manatee over here and see these flashes from boat propellers. So manatees here on a higher frequency than other larger mammals do. A study conducted by the National Geographic has found that these manatees will respond to higher frequencies if, uh, like if you have it on a boat, some kind of frequency sounder, and swim away from danger. So Florida, where so many of these manatees live, has passed state legislation to help boating issues by mandating some of these high frequency things be put on boats to help preserve the manatees. It's almost impossible to see them in the water. They blend so well. And my experience with the manatees that I've seen is that they're very curious about boats. It may not be the case for all manatees. You kind of hear some are very shy, but the ones I've seen, it's not been the case. They've been interested in what we're doing. <laughs> and want to come check out, and that may be because people are feeding them. Something to consider about animals in the wild. Let's look at the southern sea otters. They're threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Sea otters were hunted extensively for their fur between 1741 and 1911, causing healthy populations of 300,000 to fall below 2,000. And this is really fantastic story, almost a horrific story, because of why they're so important. They have this double thick fur all over their body, and so they're really cool. An international ban on sea otter hunting conservation efforts and reintroduction programs into previously populated areas have contributed to numbers climbing for the sea otter, and about two-thirds of their normal range and population have been reestablished. Sea otters are considered keystone species, and here's what that means. Their presence control, controls specific benthic or bottom-dwelling animals, herbivores, such as sea urchins, which are echinoderms, and these are sea urchins on the belly of the sea otter right here. The sea urchins graze on the lower stems of kelp, which is a form of brown algae, and that causes them to die and drift away. The loss of habitats and nutrients uh, provided by the kelp forest creates a domino effect on marine ecosystems. So if you can't keep the sea urchins in check, goodbye kelp. So it's uh, kind of an interesting thing. So I thought I'd point out, these are some of my pictures. I uh, went on a, a tour in Alaska and got to see a uh, sea otter nursery. And I didn't believe it until we got up close and personal, but basically the uh, adults had, you know, a couple of adults on duty and the rest of adults were going and finding sea urchins for everybody to eat. And they tied off their little babies with the kelp so they wouldn't drift away during high tide. It was a pretty interesting uh, thing. I, it was one of the most fascinating parts of the trip to observe. Let's look at the Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle for the Endangered Species Act. It's listed as endangered. This is Mr. Kemp over here. 
The Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle is one of the most endangered sea turtles in the world, and it's been on the Endangered Species Act uh, since 1970. It's been listed. Humans have harvested their eggs and killed the turtles for their meat and leather skins for years now, for decades. Between 1940s and the 1960s, the population plummeted as people harvested truckloads of eggs and sold them for money. Uh, so when they got listed in 1970, it made it illegal to do that. So the Kim Fridley sea turtles returned to the same beaches to lay their eggs each year. And these beaches are primarily located in Mexico and Texas, so southern coast of Texas including Padre Island would be an example of a known nesting site of the uh, sea turtles. So there are lots of conservation programs and patrols that watch the beaches and monitor the eggs and make sure they're not natural predators that try to intervene as well. So let's look at one of the funniest endangered species. And if you want to know some about the chicken dance, well, you can attribute it to this guy right here. Atwater's prairie chicken is listed as EN or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Over a century ago, there were one million chickens that lived along Texas and Louisiana coastal plains, which is over six million acres of habitat. So tall grasses, grassland type habitat, well, that changed with the growing population. Today, there's less than 1% of their original habitat remains, which is the main reason for the decline of the Atwater prairie chicken. There are a couple of captive breeding programs in place to help revitalize the populations and reintroduce them to the wild. The first one is at the uh, Fossil Rim and then of course the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge and that's down in Eagle Lake down in South Texas near Matagorda County. So this is a male Atwater right here and the idea is they do a chicken dance for mating and the bigger the uh, golden neck, the louder the song, the better the dance, the more likelihood they'll get the girl. So that's kind of where the chicken dance comes from, if you wanted to know. This is a great, if you want a good laugh and something that's just amazing to watch is the mating season of the Atwater. Make it down to the Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge during breeding season. The golden cheek warbler I alluded to earlier, it's endangered under the Endangered Species Act. It's endangered because of the reduced habitat, which is juniper and oak woodlands in central and south Texas. And I had mentioned that taking of their habitat under Section 9 would be considered a criminal uh, act, right? Many trees have been cleared to build houses, roads, and store, uh, stores, while others' habitat has been or cleared to grow agriculture. So if you take down a known nesting site of the Golden Cheek Warbler, you are guilty of taking. You're like, well, how am I supposed to know if I'm building a house? If you're building a house somewhere where there are known nesting sites in the area, an endangered uh, or a species impact a st a study has to be done, and likely you would figure that out. So if your builder, like a home builder, doesn't do that, and you're like moving to the Austin area or somewhere in that er in that region where they're primarily known to live then you probably don't have yourself the right builder. And you should know that after you take this class that you need to at least ask that question. Does a, an impact study need to be done? And if an environmental impact study does has, needs to be done and hasn't been done, then you can be held culpable as well. The Texas blind salamander is another one of those topics of animals you can't leave out of the story of Endangered Species Act. And our world of America, and they're listed as EN or endangered. This blind salamander over centuries has lost its eyesight. That's where it gets the blind. You can see it doesn't really have eyes anymore right here. It's not a very long animal. It's about this long. It lives in darkness throughout underground water systems of the Edwards limestone caverns. So the Edwards caverns are very karsted, and that's K-A-R-S-T. Karst means has holes, and that's from acidic groundwater. Its survival depends on the stability and the continued purity of the Edwards Aquifer. So if there's contamination in the Edwards Aquifer, it recharges very quickly, and this is where this animal lives. So habitat uh, threats originate from diminished spring flows, so that's overuse of the water, and pollution of groundwater from the contributing zone, which is the stuff that's on the top where stormwater runoff comes in contact with oils, pollutions, and so forth where people are. 
So this increasing demand for water and development over the recharge areas of the Edwards Aquifer poses an imminent threat to the Texas blind salamander. On top of that, it's like only found in one part of the Edwards Aquifer. So if you kind of know where um, San Marcos is, Ocarina Springs, this is one of the primary uh, locations where the Texas blind salamander lives. When we talk about the grizzly bear, it's threatened under the Endangered Species Act. In 1975, the grizzly bear was listed as threatened in all lower 48 states, and the biggest threat originates from human activity. Bears come into conflict with humans when they are attracted to our garbage, to our canister pet foods that we may feed outside or store outside, and even the bird feed that we give our birds outside. Climate change has created a more complex problem for this particular animal by contributing to the decline of the white bark pine, whose seeds represents one of the bear's most important natural food resources. So it's kind of got double the problem. Various wildlife programs have been implemented and promoted for grizzly bear recovery throughout the northern Rockies. The grizzly numbers have nearly tripled in the greater Yellowstone area in the past three decades, and 48% of bears live in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, which is Glacier National Park area, and which is called Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, as an FYI. So the recovery of the grizzly bear is definitely a success story, and kind of like the humpback whale, it's one of those that we're, we're seeing improvements and the job we're doing in restoration and conservation is paying off. Let's look at another success story on the gray wolf. Under the Endangered Species Act, it's still listed as threatened. Predator control was practiced in Yellowstone National Park in the late 1800s and early 1900s. These uh, animals were taking out ranchers, livestock, and other animals and pets and so forth, and by 1970, scientists found no evidence of a wolf population at all in Yellowstone. That's a bad thing, because Yellowstone's full of elk and other types of uh, smaller game that these animals help control their populations. So the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Recovery Plan was proposed for the reintroduction of an experimental population of wolves into Yellowstone, which is actually one of the exemptions, by the way, in Section 10. So in 1992, this experimental population was introduced into Yellowstone National Park. Now, the population is thought to have exceeded the ecological balance once again. So where do we stand on that? More to come. You'll have to watch the fate of the gray wolf. Let's look at the polar bear. Under the Endangered Species Act, it got listed as threatened. That was kind of a big signal for climate change scientists around the world when this happened. Climate change decreases the polar bear's habitat because reduced size and duration of ice platforms make it almost impossible for them to get the food resources they need to survive the swim back to the mainland. So polar bears hunt seals from a platform of sea ice, and then the reduction in sea ice cover forces the bears to swim longer distance away from the shoreline, which further depletes their energy resources that they'll need for the winter months. Rising temperatures cause the sea ice to melt earlier in the year, forcing the bears to swim to shore before they have built sufficient fat reserves for the winter. So the period of scarce food in the late summer and early fall makes for a difficult challenge and a number of drownings have occurred and then starvation. So it's a very sad story. Let's take a look at some science surveys for the Endangered Species Act. Between 1914 and 1926, at least 136 gray wolves were killed in Yellowstone National Park alone, which is one of the reasons the experimental population was needed. During September of 2014, the Federal District Court for the District of Columbia removed gray wolves in Wyoming from the protection of the Endangered Species Act. So that's kind of a unique fact, right? That wasn't very long ago. Gray wolves are again listed as a non-essential experimental population in all of the state of Wyoming. The Endangered Species Act has an exclusion cause. This is kind of interesting for listing of species. What I mean by an exclusion cause is that it could meet one of those five criteria for listing, and we don't have to list it if there's an imminent threat to human health and the environment. And this exemption clause or exclusion clause is for class and secta. So you might think, why would that be? You need to think back to biblical times and think of plagues of locusts and things of that nature and flies. 
that really caused an imminent threat to human survival, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. So it's kind of an interesting fact that the Endangered Species Act has this exclusion for class insecta, and we just want you to know that it exists. So as we conclude, I want you to be thinking about the different reasons that animals are listed. We didn't even get into the plants. The plants is a whole different ball game. But in the first half of endangered species, you kind of got the taste of there's so much history involved behind how we got to the need for the Endangered Species Act and the progression of governmental influence in that. So I hope that you'll consider conservation efforts in whatever way you can to improve the success of endangered species. I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.